Hi, and welcome to lesson two of our unit on the Constitutional Convention. As always, let's kick things off with the hook question. What was the greatest threat to American shipping after the Revolutionary War? Well, the answer is pirates. Now, how was it that a bunch of pirates could be such a threat to American shipping at this time? Well, if you reflect back on our previous lesson, we learned that the federal government or the national government at the time was super weak could not raise a whole lot of money, and because of that, didn't have a navy. Without a navy, there was no way to stop pirates from preying on American shipping vessels. And so they were a really, really big problem uh, for our country uh, right when we uh, finished uh, the Revolutionary War. So to review, under the Articles of Confederation, our national government was weak. It couldn't levy taxes. It couldn't pay off the national debt. It couldn't raise an army. It couldn't enforce its own laws. No national leader, remember the president was basically a figurehead position with no real power, and there was no national court system, so the government couldn't resolve conflicts between the states. If you remember from last lesson, New York and Vermont almost went to war with each other over a border dispute during this time, and the national government could not do anything about it. So the national government could barely pay off its debt because it couldn't levy taxes. State governments had a very similar problem. The state of Massachusetts was heavily in debt as well. However, unlike the national government, all 13 state governments had the right to tax their citizens. And the Massachusetts leaders really wanted to get rid of their debt, so they decided to tax the heck out of their people. Massachusetts state government levied a tax on everybody, but that tax fell really, really hard on the shoulders of farmers. A lot of these farmers were relatively poor. The economy wasn't doing well at this time, and they weren't able to sell their crops for a whole lot of money. And when they were, when they were taxed, they were barely able to pay them. To add insult to injury, these poor farmers were often veterans in the Revolutionary War. Now. Being poor, they needed to buy land, and if you can't afford something and you need it, what most people do, both back then and today, is they took out loans or mortgages on their land. Over time, of course, the bankers they borrowed money from came calling and demanded to be paid back. So, the farmers were squeezed between taxes from the state government and loans from the bankers. Now, the veterans who had served in the Revolutionary War were paid in what were called Continentals. But if you recall from our previous lesson, Continentals weren't worth a whole lot. In fact, they were practically worthless. Back then, there used to be an expression, something ain't worth a Continental. If you remember, this is because the, uh, the national government at the time was just printing and printing and printing and printing and printing and printing more money. And the more money you have in circulation, the less, the less value that money actually has. This is a process called inflation. So even though farmers in Western and Central Massachusetts had this money stuffed under their mattresses, the bankers and the government would not accept it. They only accepted gold and silver coins. And unfortunately for the farmers, they did not have gold or silver coins. So they could not pay off their debts. At this time, if you couldn't pay off your debt, some terrible things would happen to you. Just like today, your land would be taken by the banks. And if you lost your land, it was more than just losing your means of, of, of living if you were a farmer. If you recall, at this time, if you didn't have property, you did not have the right to vote. So essentially, not only did you lose your livelihood, but you lost your ability to change the government. You lost your ability to vote, vote for your own representatives. You lost your fundamental rights. If you failed to pay your debts, sometimes you were even thrown into prison. So the farmers were really suffering at this time. They felt rightly that their government, the state government of Massachusetts, was not protecting the rights of life, liberty, property, the pursuit of happiness, you name it. And if you recall, a certain document called the Declaration of Independence states that if a government does not protect your rights, it is the right, it is the duty of the citizens to overthrow such government. So. It wasn't long before grumblings among the farmers in western and central Massachusetts turned up into outright rebellion. 
And that rebellion was led by a man named Daniel Shays. Daniel Shays was a well-known farmer at a town called Pelham, Massachusetts. But he wasn't just a farmer. Like many of the poor farmers who were suffering under these taxes and mortgage payments, he was also a veteran who had risen to the rank of captain because of his brave service in Ticonderoga, Bunker Hill, and the Battle of Saratoga. This is a ceremonial saber that was awarded to Daniel Shays by none other than the Marquis de Lafayette for his brave, brave service. Anyway, Daniel Shays retired from the military, went back to Massachusetts, like all the other farmers, took out a loan to buy some land, and quickly fell into debt, unable to dig himself out of the hole that he was in. Naturally, this really steamed his clams. So Daniel Shays organized a lot of the local farmers and they launched a rebellion. That's number 12 in your study guide. Daniel Shays and his men called themselves the Regulators. This group of farmers slash soldiers danced on a town called Springfield in central southern Massachusetts. Springfield was important because it had an armory. And an armory, if you know, if you don't already know, is a place where the government stores weapons and cannons and swords and things. So the farmers thought this would be a really great place to hit so that they could get armed. The government in Boston knew what was going on, and they desperately tried to get help. First, they tried to raise an army by asking the national government for help. But you'll recall, under the Articles of Confederation, the national government could not levy taxes and could barely raise an army. They literally were only able to get about 100 men to put down Shays' rebellion. The national government had failed. So the state government in Boston asked the rich bankers and merchants who were benefiting from these taxes to pay up and raise an army to crush the poor farmers. They did. They raised a private army paying militiamen in Massachusetts to stand up against the farmers, and about 4,000 of these guys marched to Springfield in January and met the farmers there right outside of the armory. They brought with them a cannon, and a guy named William Shepard ultimately gave the uh, orders to fire on the farmers. Eventually, four farmers died, about 20 were wounded, and to make matters really worse, the reason that so many people were injured was the cannon that was fired fired something called a grape shot. Just imagine a shotgun that is a cannon, and that's what grape shot is for. It's called anti-personnel. Uh, it's an anti-personnel weapon intended to hurt as many people as possible. So Daniel Shea's rebellion brutally put down. The Massachusetts government was successful. The farmers dispersed. The leaders of the rebellion were arrested and sentenced to be executed. All of them, including Daniel Shays, however, were pardoned because the leadership in Massachusetts knew that they needed to make nice with the farmers so that there could be a lasting peace. However, folks around the country were seriously shaken by Shays' rebellion. Greater income and social status tended to see the rebellion as a sign that the country was at risk. They feared that if state governments became more democratic and responsive to poor people, they would vote to take property from the wealthy. These concerns were an important reason why many people, including merchants and bankers, began to argue for a stronger central government. And this is the real legacy of Shays' Rebellion. Many historians see this as the last straw in a series of failings of the national government. Remember, the national government under the Articles of Confederation could do nothing to stop the rebellion, leaving merchants and bankers um, forced to just pay um, militiamen to advance on Springfield and crush the rebellion. The national government had failed, and people in power began to realize that it needed to be changed. So. May 26, on May 25th, 1787, 55 delegates from the 13 states arrived in Philadelphia in none other than Independence Hall, and they did so um, to basically review the Articles of Confederation and make some much-needed changes. The guy that organized this constitutional convention, as it came to be called, was none other than Alexander Hamilton, a strong supporter of government reform. 
Alexander Hamilton had long believed that the, the national government was far too weak under the Articles of Confederation and needed to be changed. That wraps things up for my lesson on uh, Shays' Rebellion. Next week, we're going to look into what actually happened during the Constitutional Convention. And we're going to look into all of the compromises that went into the creation of our nation's founding document, the United States Constitution. Thanks very much for listening.